Pretty good running EMAC. Um, this particular EMAC has never seen the inside of a classroom. It is a G4 1 gigahertz with an 80 gig hard drive stock. Um, I don't recall what size it was or what, what it's in there now. Um, let's see. I think it still has the stock drive in it. Yeah, it does. 80 gigs. Hmm. 1 gigahertz. I think we can do better than that. I think we can do a lot better than that. In fact, we're going to do better than that. How many times can I say better than that? Alrighty. Shut her down. What I have to my right... Ah. Oh is the entire lower chassis or the um, the removable motherboard backplane with hard drive CD-ROM drive power supply uh, what else did I yank off of this thing um, yeah it's all there all in one block of metal and cheese I mean plastic whatever the hell this thing's made from also have a cooling fan and a power a power socket. And the idea here is to put all this junk into this piece of junk and make it a bigger piece of junk. That's the idea. Let's see what we can do. Let's set that down here. Okay. Well, Let's hop to it. So what we have here, <laughs> I probably should tell you what I'm doing. Um, we have the, basically, the logic guts of a 1.42 gigahertz EMAC. One that I had discarded uh, at work because it was being thrown away since we don't use them anymore. We're eliminating all power PCs uh, from our... Um, from our inventory of equipment because nobody wants them, nobody uses them. They don't do what we need them to do anymore. That's part of the reason. So, um, I've got this. <laughs> I threw the rest of the machine away. It was in pretty rough shape. Um, you know, the screen was going, the, uh, the case was all scratched to hell. Um, so I figured, well, I think I can do something with that. So I snagged all the parts that I think I need to make this work, and uh, here they are. I didn't expect it to have a DVD-ROM drive, or a DVD-RW drive. That was kind of a happy surprise. Um, this is actually from... It's really sad, because normally a, product, a computer this old, or this relatively new, would be very useful to my organization. Unfortunately, Apple completely dropped all support for the PowerPC, almost without warning. And um, they stopped providing updated software after 10.5. I mean, we had a good run. Uh, but this computer, actually, come to think of it, isn't, isn't that new. It's about six or seven years old, um, going on seven years old. I know this because I'm the one who pulled it out of the box when I one of the first things I did at my job when I started roughly six and a half years ago was to uncrate 
um, and it, like two pallet loads of Emacs. When Apple discontinued the Emac, or just before they did so, um, my organization purchased as many as they could. And this was in the summer of 2007. 2006. Summer of 2006. So we bought as many of these as we could, you know, with the budget money we had. And I unboxed the very last of the PowerPC um, based Emacs. And they were all 1.42s with DVD ROM or DVD RW drives, 160 gig hard drives, and they were only available to the education market. You could not buy one privately. So if I wanted one, I couldn't have bought one, even if I wanted bad enough. So we're now at the phase where we need to get rid of these machines because they're no longer, um, they no longer do what we need them to do. We run our equipment into the ground normally, but because of the lack of support for power PCs, that's not really possible anymore. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna shut the hell up and we're gonna take this apart. So one thing I should mention is this is only possible, and it may not be possible because I know that Apple loves to prevent you from swapping parts from one machine to another, um, but these are from the same, roughly the same generation. So this should simply bolt right up, no problems. If I have any issues at all, I'm gonna have to abort and uh, find a home for this motherboard. Um, I don't anticipate there to be any incompatibilities. Um, but it's always possible, and to be honest, quite likely. So what we now need to do is lay this sucker down. Taking an EMAC apart is actually one of the easiest things in the world. Um, there's only one thing I can tell you, two things actually. If you don't have the right tools, don't even try it. Just don't, <laughs> until you have the right tools. These use a hex key to take them out, such as this one. I don't know what size that is. Um, but if you're trying to do this with a Phillips head screwdriver, you need to stop. Um, at some point, someone had done that to this machine many years ago, and look at what happened. Some of them had started to round out. That's okay, I've got spares. Um, but if you don't have the right screwdriver, it's not a screwdriver, it's, a, it's actually a, an Allen wrench or an Allen key or a hex head uh, screwdriver, don't try it with a Torx. For God's sake, use a hex. Um, I find that a lot of people get frustrated and pissed off because they just don't have the right tools. Um, and then they start rounding them off, and then they're screwed. Then you've got to drill them out with an easy out. Not worth it. Just use the right damn tools. <laughs> My rant for the day. The second thing about these Emacs is that once, uh, well, the first time you take this cover off, you're going to want to have to put something into it, some force. Lay the machine face down, sitting on a soft towel, or I use mouse pads. Grasp the case by the sides and pull up lightly, like that, just to break it free. And then once you're pulling it up, you want to make sure that you can see through the hand hole here, um, there is a power connector, power switch connector that you've got to worry about. On these newer versions, the power cable, I'm sorry, the switch cable is... Um, is lengthened slightly. So, but on the earlier ones, like the 700 megahertz models, and uh, well, the first generation, the problem with these is that the uh, cable is so short that if you pull too quickly, you'll snap it. Power cable or lead, sorry, goes right to the switch here, the push button switch. So when you pull up in this cover, and I'm not gonna, I don't have a tripod with me, I have one downstairs, but I'm too freaking lazy to use it. And I'll show you what I mean. So when you pull up on it, I'm gonna 
show you how to get this best I can without a tripod. But there's a cable that leads up to the switch. You want to grasp that and disconnect it. If you don't do that, here's what happens. Hmm. Be very gentle with it. Okay? And here's why. Here's where it all matters. That cable, when tugged, doesn't break the cable, per se. More often than not, what will happen is, is you will break the power button itself. And there it is. Now let me tell you a little bit about these power buttons. Zoom in on it a little bit. It's held in by a one-way, one-time use fastener. This fastener, when removed, cannot be reinstalled the power button will actually break apart internally. If you break that power button, you have to replace it. That would be fine if Apple was still making parts for these, but the problem is you can no longer buy those. So once you break it, you might as well throw the machine in the dumpster unless you have another cover because you can't remove it from another machine unless you take the whole cover with you. They use different power buttons between the 700 megahertz models and the uh, newer generation like this one. Really a pain in the neck. Just do as I say and unplug this. I don't want to sound too condescending, but I just want to make sure I'm giving you guys clear, concise information. Removing the logic board assembly. By the way, these machines are built. Man, are they ever. Um... These things are built like tanks. Um, I mean, that didn't really help make them last longer. Obviously, obsolescence is now the, the killing factor here. Um, but they are built quite well. <clears throat> These are over-tightened. I am the last one to have this one apart, but not the first one. I didn't round out those freaking screw heads. Um, but anyway, so we're going to just, we're going to take the entire motherboard sled out, as I described earlier to you guys, and we're going to just pop in the 1.42. I even have the, um, the front cover, the, the little pull-down door. So, real quick, I'm going to show you where these screws are so you can actually see what I'm doing. Um, I already have a bad feeling about this. I don't think it's going to mount up. I have a really bad feeling about this. I think I'm wasting my time. Well, that's a given. Um, but, well, actually, no, I'm looking at, I'm comparing the fans, and they look pretty much exactly the same. Um, I only grabbed the other fan because it was already clean. Yeah. Anyway. Take that cover off. Do a quick comparison. Um, so we've taken the main RF shield off, and we're now down to the bare motherboard. All right. Okay. So let's uh, let's flip this on its back here. What I want to do is quickly compare the two sleds to see if there's any glaring differences, like mounting tab locations because that'll make or break this project. This is easier said than done. Just everything is so awkward. Anyway. <clears throat> well, so far, things are looking pretty similar. I'm looking at locations of connectors. I already see a difference. And, oh man. And the way Apple does things, these differences can be so subtle at first that you don't notice them. And then, yeah, this is an, there's two years difference between these two machines. I'm already thinking this isn't going to happen for us. Um, son of a... Yeah, I don't think it's going to work out. 
There's some, there's some very key difference is. Okay, I think I was I was overreacting. It looks like the, the, the cable that I was referring to, the connector, which is this one here, it's on the back side of this one, on the bottom, or on the top of that one, but on the bottom, and this one is the power switch um, cable. Other than that, things look pretty good. I think I'll be all right. Copyright 2003, which is when the second generation was released, I believe. The first one came out in like 2002, if I recall. Um, they were very close uh, in release. The, the original eMac was only around for like a year. And then um, the second gen came out shortly after and was discontinued officially in like 2000 late 2005 early 2006 so I'm gonna grab a different screwdriver there we go oh now I have been a, um, a certified Apple technician since 2006 and uh, I remember when they discontinued support officially for the eMac um, it was uh, it was right around the time the unibody MacBooks came out and the uh, MacBook Airs. <laughs> that was that was a few years ago. That was three years after the last eMac was sold because they have to support them for those the three years for the for the Apple Care customers. But as soon as they uh, they announced it. Um, I was actually at that, it was like a tech conference for Apple technicians. The entire room erupted in cheers when the woman who was running the presentation said, oh, by the way, <laughs> we no longer have to support these. Everyone was like, whoa, yeah. I was a little insulted because I like the Emacs. But what can you do? Um, so anyway, just that was the highlight of my day then. But as a school district, um, we loved the Emacs because they were an all-in-one affordable package. Um, and after they discontinued the Emacs, they replaced them with a 17-inch uh, flat panel Intel, um, the educational models. See, Apple actually sells secret educational models that are only available to colleges, um, K through 12 institutions such as ours. Um, and they're available to students and, and, and faculty if they're purchased through the uh, district or institutional purchasing plan. And they came out with a model of the 17-inch iMac when they first released the Intel version. It was the educational model and it featured half the amount of memory, a 1.83 gigahertz processor. Um, it did not have the Bluetooth option. It did not include an Apple remote. So. It had, I don't even think it had a spot on the motherboard for a Bluetooth card. It was pretty stripped down. And it would only support, unfortunately, it would only support, I think it was one and a half gigs or something of RAM, or it was a less amount than the standard model. And when we bought a whole bunch of those in 2000 and summer of 2006 I remember that uh, 2007 sorry I remember that visit I remember that vividly um, anyway it's all excited but we mistakenly left one in a closet I didn't do this somebody else did completely accidentally it just never got re never was assigned or unpacked and we found it three years later. <laughs> It was funny. We found a three-year-old Mac in the original box, never even opened. And uh, we're like, how the hell did that happen? It eventually got reassigned and 
sent to a classroom where it belonged in the first place. But that was not That was odd. I would like to do that someday, though. Buy a machine, buy a computer, any random one. Stick it in a closet somewhere and forget about it. And then ten years later, when I remember it's there, like, hey, that's kind of cool. But the truth is, it's not like a classic car where it'll eventually appreciate in value. Unless it's something super cool like a 20th anniversary Mac. That would be something. But sadly, those are all gone. So, get all these screws out. Doing this one-handed is loads of fun. Is that it? I think that was it. Um... Nope, oh, nope, there's one. Just one. A long, tiring day. That with the old. Oh, right. There's one difference that I completely glazed over because I actually, honest to God, forgot. The 1.42 gig Emacs use DDR RAM, which marks Apple's switch to DDR RAM. That's all well and good, but I can't use my PC-133 memory on this stupid thing. Which means I now have to obtain more memory. That's okay, I'm sure I have some lying around somewhere in my scrap piles of hell. Uh, but other words look pretty similar. Not much difference. Um, well, yeah, there is a difference, but it's not, like, glaring. I wonder if it'll accept my, uh, my airport card. Yeah, it, so it, it still uses the same Airport Express. I like that. Um, good. All uh, right. So looks like it uses the same power supply, though. That's good. Um, I'm going to leave this hard drive in there. I'm just going to reformat it. So... Yeah, sweet. So a faster memory and a faster processor. I can't think of a better way to extend the life of an old machine. Awesome. Now, I've already pretty much mounted everything. Um, I'm a little concerned, however. The, um, the connector that connects the logic board to the analog board, I don't think it worked. What that connection actually does is it sends power from the analog board basically to the secondary. It, it actually goes right, it's this connector here. And I couldn't get a good firm seat on it, so <laughs> probably isn't going to light up, but we're going to try it anyway. Let's see what happens. Yeah, I, I don't think it's going to work. Well, I'll well, bust my buttons. Um, so, yeah, that sends voltage from the analog board to the, to the, uh, from the analog board, sorry, to the logic board. And it looks like it's coming up. Well, that was easy. So now what we need to do is basically button everything up. I want to make sure that it fully boots, of course. Um, and I'm, I'm going to have to score some more DDR RAM. I think I have a surplus of 512 sticks, so that might be helpful. Looks like it's working. Unfortunately, I had to power it up with the lid on because I, I actually had a jumper. It's a four-pin connector uh, from the power switch to the logic board. And um, I had a, uh, a, a little jumper that I made up, a remote switch, if you will, that would let me turn these on with the lids off, but I don't have that anymore. So I'd like to see it come up completely. Okay came up. Shut her down. 
Oh, that just put it to sleep. No big deal. I'm rebuilding it anyway. All right, so hard part's done. Now I just need to finish putting it together. And I was actually worried that that wasn't going to work. But my fears were unfounded. All right, folks, here it is. All buttoned up. Well, no, not really. But everything is in place, except for the belly pan or the bottom RF shield. I just want to give it a quick once over to make sure I didn't miss any screws. I don't think I did. Everything looks dashing. Yeah, dashing. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's get the belly pan back on. Here she is. zip tied these uh, wiring harnesses back to where they're supposed to be. That one too. And this has to be locked in here. It was a very simple swab. I, I did not expect it to be that easy. Um, and here's why. Apple has a culture of forcing their products into disuse after a short period of time. And in doing that, they deliberately uh, restrict reverse compatibility um, of some parts with other machines. Um, I've seen some really subtle design changes or like placing screw holes in different locations or moving motherboard connectors to a different spot so that it won't be usable in another chassis. But in this case, they I guess they went the cheaper route and they just kept as many parts as they could from one model to the next um, after the redesign. And they made my job so much easier. <laughs> I'm, I'm ecstatic. Um, so I'm ready to put the cover back on and screw it in place. And uh, Now I have to rebuild the machine. I've got to um, rerun the OS 10.5 install. Um, I do have to put more memory in this. It only has 512 in it now. Uh, I want to max it out. So I wonder if this one will take more than a gig. I'm just realizing that because it's a DDR machine, it might actually take two gigs. Don't forget to reattach the stand. Old Mac. New Emac. Ah, let's power it up after a uh, quick tear down and rebuild. Let's see if I can. Too late. Let's see if I can still option boot it. I'm gonna boot it off my um, 10.5 DVD. Open sesame. Come on. Come on. You can do it. That was a bad impression of whatever that was from. You know, I'm starting to think that DVD-ROM drive, or RW drive, sorry, is not original. I think I installed that uh, several years ago. Um, and I expressly told the person who uses this machine that that would not work with iDVD. Something vaguely comes to mind like that. I, I, I think I installed that myself. I could be wrong, and I probably am. Come on. All right, here we go. Boot it up. I need to find out what the maximum memory is for the new model that it is now. Um, I want to say it's two gigs. 
but I know I think it's like a gig. Well, I'm going to find out. Okay, and with that, I bid you a good night. Um, that was a success. So, in uh, in retrospect, the recap of what we basically had done is we have turned this one gigahertz CMAC that was in excellent condition, um, lightly used, and we swapped in a 1.42 gigahertz motherboard. And actually, we ended up doing the entire uh, motherboard sled and all components, hard drive, CD-ROM drive, did the, did it all, and just swapped it right in there. Um, so we took one of the earliest of the second generation models and turned it into one of the later second edition models, the last of the second edition. I also confirmed that uh, through lemlowendmac.com that this machine will unofficially support two gigabytes of RAM. So we've actually increased the processor speed, the bus speed, and the memory speed all in one fell swoop, um, which is pretty sweet. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and order up two one gig modules and pop them in there and I'll have the best steam hack in the world <laughs> if you can imagine such a thing um, and I'm gonna leave the 160 and that I that came with the swapped up parts which I'm now formatting and installing OS 10.5 which is the latest OS supported by the eMac and the G4 or G series architecture power PC architecture so I hope this has answered some un unasked questions for you guys, and maybe you have a better understanding of how the EMAC is assembled and what it takes to pull it apart. Um, I've been getting a lot of questions about that lately, so here you go.